<clears throat> Hello, <clears throat> welcome to the first lecture uh, that we will have of four lectures on uh, the book of Acts. These will be a part of each week's activities. Um, I am coming to you tonight from the Mike Baird Chair of New Testament Studies. That's because this is the chair where Mike Baird sits to study the New Testament. But I thought it might sound rather distinguishing if you knew it was coming from the chair of New Testament Studies. Welcome to these series of lectures. It's good to see you again, or at least I'm glad that you can see me again, and I look forward to seeing you uh, tomorrow. Just a few preliminary comments before we get to Acts chapters 1 through 7. That will be the topic for our first lecture. If there were a title for these series of lectures, a title that would summarize what the book of Acts is about, we would have to say that it would be the birth and the early growth of the church. The story that is written in the book of Acts is about the church. It is the history of the early church, the first part of the uh, history of the church that we are a part of now. <clears throat> it tells us about the origins <clears throat> of the church. And uh, even of the origins of what is going on in our churches today. In a sense, the book of Acts is to uh, the history of the church what Genesis is, the book of Genesis is to the history of the world. The book of Acts, uh, it tells us of our genesis as a church, uh, the genesis of the organization that you will spend your life serving in. Uh, and so the book of Acts is extremely important for us understanding the church. It is about the birth and the early growth of the church. The method for these lectures that we will be following in the next few weeks will be to track prominent themes throughout the book of Acts. As we go through each section uh, of the book of Acts, as we follow the story all the way through from Acts 1 to Acts 28, we will also, in these lectures, uh, track uh, several themes, prominent themes that run all the way through the book of Acts. So each lecture will cover a major section, and each time we talk, uh, I will not only summarize that major section, but we will track these four major themes. If you have your reading guide, your study and reading guide that I gave to you, uh, the list of those major themes uh, are there, uh, and it explains that besides following the story and uh, as it progresses, which is the main thing that book the book of Acts is, it's a story. But uh, there are also the theme of the church and its ministry and its structures, its organization, its strategies. There's the theme that we find in the speeches of Acts, which uh, will be uh, the message of the church to the world. Uh, the theme of the work of the Holy Spirit is very prominent all the way through the book of Acts. So we will track that theme in each lecture. <clears throat> and then also I will comment on cultural and geographical features. Uh, that are a part of each section of Acts as we <clears throat> go through. Just a word about these themes. These themes are more like currents in a river. Uh, there will be uh, the slower water on the side uh, uh, along the bank of the river. There will be faster currents in the middle. There will be side currents uh, in a river, but all of these currents flow together. They all form the river and they all Mix, uh, mix and mesh with one another. And that is the way these themes are in Acts. We don't just pull out what, what one passage says about the Holy Spirit without understanding how it flows together with all of the other important themes uh, and features of the book of Acts. So we really are going to be looking at the various currents that flow through the story of the book of Acts, and perhaps we'll be able to see better how they mix and mesh together. Uh, <clears throat> so let's get to uh, the first uh, the first section of Acts, uh, which today is Acts 1 through 7, chapters 1 through 7. 
Uh, the title for this first section of the story of Acts is the early church in Jerusalem. Get your Bible uh, right now. Uh, you might have to put put me on pause, and uh, but get your Bible and also get the reading study guide. I've already referred to it, and I will refer to it again several times. And it has information that I suppose I could have put on a a PowerPoint for you on this lecture, but I haven't figured out quite how to do that yet. Maybe not by next Monday I will. So let's take a look at this first section, Acts 1 through 7. First thing I want to do, and I will do this, uh, follow this procedure every week with each section, is to simply go through the main events uh, that are recorded in the book of Acts during this, in this case, the early uh, church, the story of the early church in Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> there is a, 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 the list of all these events is in your reading study guide uh, with uh, scripture references there. So if you have that or can get that uh, uh, there in front of you along with your Bible, because we will be looking at certain passages, uh, it will help you uh, in this lecture. So let's take a look at the major events <clears throat> that, uh, that we're told about uh, in this first part of the book of Acts. The book opens in Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through uh, the first few verses. Uh, it would be 1, 1 through 11. Uh, the book opens with uh, Luke's depiction or uh, account of the ascension of Jesus. He already told us about it in the last part of his gospel. But in he starts the book of Acts by reviewing, going back to that event, and thus overlapping the, the two books together, since he wrote both, and they both flow together, and we'll deal with some of those issues as we uh, go along. <clears throat> but uh, Luke actually uses this um, story of the ascension, this account or narrative of the ascension here, <clears throat> uh, not only to connect to the previous story, as he says, uh, in the very first verse, all that Jesus began to do, I've already told you about all that Jesus began to do and say, and then he goes on to tell us uh, what uh, the, the apostles, how the apostles carry on. But Luke uses this section to introduce some of the major purposes and ideas that we should be looking for in the book of Acts. Uh, for instance, in uh, verse 1, <clears throat> I will be putting on my glasses once in a while so I can read. <clears throat> in verse 1, he says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. In verse 1, of course, Luke wants us to see that the story, the narrative that we're looking at is a continuation of what Jesus has done, a continuation of his ministry. I think that throws a very important perspective on the book of Acts. We have to understand that Luke is trying to help us to see that what is going on, what is moving this story forward, what is bringing this church into existence is the continued ministry of Jesus, although it is through the presence of his spirit and not in his bodily form. I know that brings us to the second thing that I just read, where Luke refers to the apostles that Jesus had chosen. Because the book, as you know, the title is The Acts of the Apostles. The book tells us about what these apostles did as they followed through on the commissions, the commandments, that Jesus had given them. They become the main human actors or characters in this story, uh, just as Jesus was the main human actor and character in the gospel story. Now the apostles step up to take their place. Uh, we read about the Peter. He is a major uh, character. John. <clears throat> we also read about uh, the apostle Paul, who was, of course, not chosen by Jesus during his ministry. But uh, that's one reason why Luke spends so much time to tell us about the work of Paul, so much time to tell us about the conversion of Paul, so that we understand that uh, in his 
in his awesome wisdom, he, God, also chose Paul as an apostle, along with Peter and John, uh, to bring this church into being. Uh, in verses 4, 5, and 8, we also observe that Luke redacts, or he adds to his story of the ascension. Let me read that in Acts 1, 4. <clears throat> Luke tells us, on one occasion, while he was eating with them, that is Jesus, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard from uh, me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke redacts his earlier version of the ascension by adding Jesus' comments about uh, the coming work of the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, in the commission that Luke records in verse 8, he says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So through this redaction work, uh, Luke helps us to catch another very important theme uh, and be aware of it, and that, of course, is the work of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> in the book of Acts. Uh, another very, very important uh, addition. And we'll come back to some of these features. Uh, and then also in verse 8, Luke sets the, uh, actually what you might call the geographical agenda uh, for the birth and the growth of the church that we find in the book of Acts. In verse 8, <clears throat> Jesus says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Notice the geography. This story the book of Acts is going to start in Jerusalem, as we will see tonight. Then it moves out to the surrounding territories, to Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and then into Syria. And then eventually, the final chapter will have Paul, the story of the church ending in Rome. And so this this commission that Jesus gives, Luke puts it here also to help us to understand that as we look at the book of Acts, we are going to see uh, a, a, the birth of an organization, a group, an institution, the church, uh, that will start in Jerusalem, <clears throat> but uh, will take its, uh, find its context, its fullest and best context uh, <clears throat> in the broader scope of the Greco-Roman world and, of course, now, all over the entire planet. So there is a little bit of a, an agenda that we see in this, uh, this section. So the, the, uh, the book starts off then uh, with uh, the uh, ascension of Jesus. Uh, then uh, in the rest of chapter one, we're told that the disciples begin meeting uh, together in Jerusalem. Uh, they select a replacement for uh, the apostle Judas who of course, had committed suicide. Uh, and so we see attention given to the structure, the organization of the church. Then in chapter 2, <clears throat> we are told about how the power of the Spirit fills the church. We usually talk about it as Pentecost or the day of Pentecost. Uh, <clears throat> and um, at this time, we are told, the, the record tells us, that the church, uh, most take the view that it, this is the moment when the church is truly born as the spirit filled, uh, as the uh, community and the organization of spirit filled believers of Christ carrying the gospel to the world. Uh, this is the birth of the church. <clears throat> uh, I would only comment uh, here uh, that uh, uh, and, and the title of this uh, period within the event, within the early church, is The Power of the Spirit Fills the Church. Uh, I think it's helpful to understand right up front and early on that by filling here, this does not imply that there is some sort of liquid or some sort of substance or that there is going to be an emptying necessarily. In this case, what we see is that these people... Uh, 
the, the apostles, the women, the, the family of Jesus, all that were there at that time, <clears throat> they were filled with Christ. They were filled with the Spirit of Christ. They were filled with a person, with Christ, through his Spirit. Jesus had told them that he would come back after he had left them. He would come back and guide them to understand, remember what he had said, and he promised that through a helper, uh, he would come back and help them. And of course, this helper, this paraclete, is the Holy Spirit. So what we're looking at here is Jesus himself moving in to where he said he wanted to live uh, within his church and within our hearts. This is Jesus moving in to take residence in the church and in each believer. Let's always remember that the filling of the Holy Spirit was not simply the filling of you and me as individuals. It is perhaps first and foremost the filling of the church, and it is in this context that we experience this filling of the Holy Spirit. He didn't just fill persons. He filled whole groups of people, and one day, his Spirit will, of course, cover and fill all of the earth. So on the day of Pentecost, the, the power of the Holy Spirit filled the church. And immediately following that, in the middle part of, of Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up, <clears throat> as you know, and preached the first Christian sermon. So that's the major event. Uh, there are several substantive sermons that Luke recorded that, that Peter preached, uh, and then later on that Paul and others uh, spoke, uh, but Luke includes many uh, quite uh, substantive uh, Christian sermons to various audiences, to a synagogue. Paul preached to the synagogue. Peter, of course, preached to the Sanhedrin. He preached to the Jewish people on the street in Jerusalem uh, and to various audiences uh, that, these, uh, that, that the Christian sermons were preached. But this is the first Christian sermon that we have. Uh, Luke, of course, uh, fills the book, fills the book of Acts, full of these speeches. Uh, this, of course, this first one is the standard, really, for all of the others. And the main lesson that I want us to learn from, uh, uh, from these speeches as we track them, we are going to track them through the book of Acts, is uh, I want us to learn what constituted, uh, because this is what the speeches tell us, what constituted the very essence of of the church's message to the world. When you look at all these speeches together, there's just a few that don't fit into this category. When you look at these uh, sermons all together, uh, the, it, it becomes very clear, Luke wants us to see very clearly what was the very core and essence of, of the message of the church to the world. Some call it the gospel, Paul called it the kerygma, uh, but it is the essence of the message of the church which, of course, becomes also the essence and the core of Christian theology altogether. So we'll look at this sermon a little bit later. <clears throat> then the next thing that uh, Luke does is he gives us a summary in uh, Acts chapter uh, 4, uh, 2, excuse me, Acts 2, 42. Uh, Luke gives us a little bit of a summary of the various activities of the early church, the ministries of the early church. And then following that, in the three chapters following that, chapters three, four, and five, Luke gives us anecdotes, stories, uh, to show us the church doing these things that he tells us about in, uh, in that uh, summary section in Acts chapter two, verses 42 through 47. So we have two sections that just sort of give us a good, clear picture of what uh, what the church did in those early days. And it's not just to give us a picture, but it's to help us to understand uh, how the church responded to the message of Jesus and the commissions of Jesus and how they fleshed it out. <clears throat> and uh, these, of course, become a good model for us, although <clears throat> we don't, we're not called upon to replicate every single uh, event, and I'll, I'll be talking about that as we go along. Um, but uh, we have this summary of the, uh, the work of the church and then some anecdotes, stories that tell us how the church did that. Then in chapter 6, uh, we read that the church had grown to a certain uh, size 
that they had to actually change the organization. They had to add a new leadership level. Uh, the apostles did because they were the main leaders at that point. They had to add a new level of leadership and chose seven uh, assistants. Uh, some would say that this is the origin of the office of deacon. Perhaps it is uh, because the word for deacon is used in the passage to describe what both the apostles and these seven assistants uh, do <clears throat> for the church. Uh, but uh, this would be the historical kernel of, of a very important change and addition to the leadership structure of the church. And then following that in the last event that we're told about is the work of Stephen, who is one of those seven assistants. And Stephen gives us yet a, a, another fuller uh, perspective or better perspective or another perspective uh, on, on how, uh, what kind of leaders there were in the church and how they did their work. And of course, uh, Stephen, as we will see, uh, as you will see in your reading, became the first Christian martyr. Uh, so this is what Acts 1 through 7 uh, is about. Uh, just a little bit of a review and a few comments. Let me now turn to uh, track some of those themes that I mentioned or these currents that I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> Let me turn now to track uh, some of these. Uh, and uh, if you have your reading or study guide, uh, you will see that I've listed some of those uh, currents. Uh, the ones that we will cover now are the church ministry and structure and strategies, what, uh, what these chapters, Acts 1 through 7, tell us about uh, the church's ministries, their, their structures, leadership structures, organizational structures, and their strategies. Uh, then we will also track uh, the speeches uh, in Acts a little bit, uh, we won't be able to go into a lot of detail, but I'll track a few ideas. Then we will look at the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, a little bit more than we have already. <clears throat> and then we will look at the cultural realities, challenges and realities uh, that, uh, that we find operating uh, in this story. And all of these themes, all of these currents uh, play a big part uh, in, uh, in understanding the story that Luke tells us. They're a big part of that story. So let's take a look. Let, let's just take a few minutes to track these four currents the, as, the, as we follow them through uh, the first section of the book of Acts. First of all, church ministries, church ministry, and church structure, and church strategies. Uh, so the first and the order of these themes is, is not indicative of which might be the most important. They all flow together. They're all critical and important. But since the book of Acts is, is mainly focused on the early church, uh, let me uh, start with what uh, this, and, and of course, uh, this, the story of the very birth of the church in these chapters, uh, will give us a very, very good view of, of what what in essence the church as it came into being, what it was. <clears throat> so church ministry, structure, and strategies. I would point out mainly one thing uh, from this section, and that is the importance of the apostles. We will follow this theme through and we'll see a lot more uh, information about changing church structures and strategies and, and tasks <clears throat> but uh, in, in Acts 1 through 7, uh, the major characters, the human characters, are uh, the apostles, Peter and John especially. Uh, but the uh, apostles are referred to as the 12 or the 11. Uh, and so there's, they are seen as a group uh, in this uh, section. So they are very important. Uh, just a few reminders of what we've heard already. These apostles were already chosen and trained, carefully trained, by Jesus. And so they are just carrying on the ministry of Jesus. Uh, that it certainly appears to be what they, they believed they should do, as Jesus had told them to do. <clears throat> and the way they structured and carried out their work, it appears that they modeled their ministry, the church, the church's ministry, after the ministry uh, of Jesus. 
Uh, just a few interesting thoughts. For instance, in, in Acts 1, 21, when we are told <clears throat> that uh, the church uh, chose a, uh, an apostle to replace Judas, in Acts 1, 21, it says, uh, Peter announces to them uh, when they are choosing the person, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us with uh, the whole time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these, that is one of these replacements, is a replacement apostle, must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Uh, so the apostle uh, certainly was qualified to be the apostle. Uh, at least these early 12 apostles were qualified to be apostles because they were the ones who had committed themselves to follow Jesus, to learn everything that Jesus said and watch what he did and witness to it and testify to it and pass it along. And so uh, this, this interesting little uh, statement here helps us to understand one of the very important uh, functions uh, of, of an apostle <clears throat> that was uh, intended by the Lord. Uh, another interesting reference is in chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, a reference to the apostles. In this summary of church ministry, Luke starts off by saying, they, that is the people of the church, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching uh, and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. That first reference, the apostles' teaching. One of the very most important things that the apostles were to do in this early period in which they did faithfully was to organize uh, their, their understanding of Jesus' life, uh, to put it together in such a way, to organize it in such a way that they could clearly teach what Jesus had said and done uh, among them. <clears throat> uh, this was, of course, a part of their task of bearing witness uh, to Jesus especially bearing witness, as Jesus had said, all that he had said and done and was to be taught to them. This, of course, this apostolic teaching that is referred to here is the beginning of the Jesus tradition. And apparently at very first, it was primarily just oral. They had not written it down. We have no documents to show that they had written it down. But it certainly was a body of teaching that was passed along as a body of teaching. Uh, and then in 6, 2 through 4 is another very uh, uh, good passage to catch a look at the work of the apostles. In Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, we're told that the church had run into some problems. We'll come back to those in a few minutes. And they needed to find a new uh, group of leaders to help them. And so in chapter 6, verse 2, <clears throat> we're told... <clears throat> So the twelve, that is the apostles, gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us, that is the apostles, uh, to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. In the Greek, wait on tables is to minister to tables. So we have two references to ministry. Uh, uh, the ministry uh, uh, down in... Uh, uh, Verse 4, it says, we, or verse 3, uh, the, the apostle said, we will turn our responsibility over them and give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. So the apostles, uh, in this structural expansion, maintained their ministry, but not the ministry to the human needs of the people. They turned that ministry over to uh, the seven assistants, who incidentally were all Hellenistic Christians. Uh, and uh, they would maintain their ministry uh, as the ministry of the word. So we see a sort of a, a, a dual ministry, uh, two categories of ministry, of course, working together. Uh, and of course, now the church leadership structure will reflect those two very important aspects of the ministry of the church. <clears throat> so, uh, uh, so we have uh, in in, in following the apostles, tracking the apostles' work uh, in this section, we can see some uh, important features of the, uh, the fundamental essence of the work of the church. 
let's take a look at another current or theme, and that would be the speeches of Acts. Um, here we are going to be looking at the, as I mentioned earlier, the essential Christian message, the essential message, some would say the gospel message. Uh, <clears throat> Luke often calls it, and Paul often calls it, simply the word of the Lord, or just the word. Uh, but it is, uh, and it's also called the kerygma. Paul calls it the kerygma. But it is the essential message that the church uh, had to share uh, with the world. And the speeches in Acts, all the way through Acts, not just in this first section, uh, give us a good view of that. We will track that. But what I would like to do is to look at the first Christian sermon. Uh, if you have your Bible, get it ready. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> and it begins in verse 14. And so I want to just sort of move through that sermon to give you uh, a good idea of, of the, uh, the nature of these sermons, because this is sort of the uh, pattern, it would seem, uh, for uh, many other Christian sermons, Peter's other sermons, and, uh, and even Paul. Uh, later on, uh, it's also fascinating to uh, track the uh, the uh, the slight or the nuanced changes within this message. But it's also, of course, interesting to see what remained absolutely the solid core of the Christian message. So let's just take a look at this uh, uh, speech in uh, verses 14 through 21. Peter starts off by saying, "Then Peter stood up with the eleven raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk as you suppose. And he goes on to talk about those 11 uh, apostles who are preaching in various languages, which might have given some the impression that they were under the influence, apparently, uh, of something besides the Holy Spirit. But of course, Peter starts off his sermon by a, in a very uh, uh, healthy homiletical way. Uh, the introduction to his sermon starts with where the people are. They're all wondering what is going on and, and sensing an incredible spiritual excitement. And so Peter starts there. He starts to answer their question. What really is going on? Are these people drunk or what is going on? So I would simply point out that when we're looking at these speeches, we're looking at good, solid uh, sermons, uh, homiletical presentations, good, solid discourses and speeches. Uh, they're not just uh, uh, saying some things. They are designed and structured and delivered uh, to, uh, to be rhetorically very effective for the audience. So Peter starts with this inter inter introduction and notice also that he doesn't just explain that, that, that it's not a matter of drunkenness, but their spiritual power, but he also uses the Old Testament scripture, the scripture in Joel, to point out that this is what God said would happen in the last days. So in his introduction, Peter not only helps them to begin thinking about this experience that they're, this power that they're feeling and this experience that they're seeing, just see it in a different way, but he also wants them to see it within the framework of their own theology, and especially their eschatology, because Jews were interested in when the Messiah would come again and the kingdom of God would come. And so Peter gets their attention very effectively in this introduction. Then in verses 22 through 35, we have the, the, the basic body, we might say, of this <clears throat> sermon. And in it, of course, we see a certain core uh, that is there. Um, it is the core of the Christian message. So let's take a look um, at that. Verse 32, 22, excuse me. Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, that is the center of a Christian sermon, at least the sermons and the speeches in Acts. 
Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. So he starts off focusing on Jesus of Nazareth. He starts off with the marvelous life of Jesus. And then he goes to the next. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. So he goes to the death of Jesus. That, of course, we're getting now to the very uh, rock-bottom core of the Christian message, but it doesn't end there. But, verse 24, God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, <clears throat> because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And so he now goes to the resurrection. Uh, then if you will notice down <clears throat> um, verse 32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of this fact. And now exalted to the right hand of God, he, that is this Jesus of Nazareth, he, this Messiah, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out uh, what you now hear and see. Interestingly, uh, Peter adds to the very core of the Christian message, Jesus of Nazareth, his marvelous life, his death, his resurrection. Uh, he also adds uh, Jesus' ascension, and he connects the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost he connects it with Jesus' ascension. He biblically connects it to that. <clears throat> so uh, the, the center of this sermon is basically the, the earthly uh, career of Jesus or the career of Jesus the Messiah as he came among us in his life, his death, his resurrection, and his ascension back to the Father. And now we see the full power of that action taking place <clears throat> in our midst. Uh, of course, he ends his sermon uh, with the place that he started it, or at least he ends the body of his sermon in the place uh, that he started that. This is in verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, and who is alive and ascended, and whose spirit is among us. He has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, Lord and Christ. That is the core of the Christian message. We will see it again, not in exactly those same words, but we will see those same elements, or most of them, uh, consistently <clears throat> in the Christian sermon. The last part of the sermon is the call to response. That's always a good thing to do, especially in a Christian sermon, as to call people to response. And of course, as you know, Peter is interrupted which is not always a bad thing when you're preaching. But Peter is interrupted, and the people say, What shall we do? And Peter replied in verse 38, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, so Peter, uh, his, his call to response is basically, Repent and be baptized. Now, we debate uh, that a lot, especially what kind of response is being called for. And so, <clears throat> just at least to give you perspective on how to answer it, this is exactly what John the Baptist had said when he called people to the kingdom of God. Repent and be baptized. This is exactly what Jesus said when he walked upon the scene, announced the kingdom of God, and he called for repentance and also utilized baptism. Uh, so however we understand Peter's response here, we have to understand that it was consistent with uh, what how the kingdom of God had been introduced by John and, and brought into being uh, by Jesus. Certainly, of course, the issue is not just repentance and uh, baptism and repentance, but the real deep issue is forgiveness of sin. Uh, and so the response, of course, is the call to receive God's reconciliation, God's forgiveness, <clears throat> which would certainly be 
uh, depicted and, uh, and received by baptism and repentance. And so Peter ends his sermon then uh, with this, um, this call to, to repentance. In, in other Christian sermons, following it in other places in Acts, uh, even in the section we're in, uh, faith is added. Uh, they, they're called to believe in Jesus and repent. Uh, so uh, this, this would be a, a, just a little close-up look at one of the speeches and some of the important features. Let's also track uh, the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit uh, in this section, Acts 1 through 7. <clears throat> this, of course, is a major theme all through the letter, and I'm not going to say a lot about it. I've already mentioned some things about the filling of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. But let me just point out some things. Uh, this, this radical experience of spiritual power that is seen on the day of Pentecost is actually seen repeated several times all through the book of Acts. In other words, there are other Pentecosts in the book of Acts. That is, times when uh, the group of believers uh, or certain parts of the group of the believers are, are filled with the Spirit and the same sort of dynamic spiritual power is evident among them. Uh, after uh, we're told that uh, in another chapter or two, that after they had been severely persecuted in, <clears throat> in, uh, in, by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem, they went aside to, to heal and to pray, and they asked the Lord to give them boldness and not be afraid because of the persecution. And we're told another Pentecostal experience of filling the community and, and overflowing them. Uh, took place, or when the first Gentile, uh, Cornelius and his family, uh, were converted, a, 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 an experience of in, intense, dramatic spiritual power and signs that accompanied it uh, also happened with his family. Uh, and uh, then later on, when uh, Paul got to Ephesus and found some of John the Baptist's disciples, uh, they also had this, this dramatic experience uh, <clears throat> these various Pentecosts that happen in the book of Acts uh, appear to be God's way of signaling to the church at various important critical points in their work and forward movement. God's way of signaling to the church that they are moving in the right direction. Uh, we'll track some more of that. <clears throat> the, uh, the last thing that I want to track is the some of the cultural realities and features uh, that are important in this section that we're looking at uh, uh, tonight. <clears throat> um, and really, there's only one that I want to, to dwell on, and, uh, and that is the uh, presence within the early church in Jerusalem of two uh, major ethnic groups among the Jews. In Jesus' day, in Paul's day, Judaism had two major ethnic divisions within it. The Palestinian Jews, these would be Jews who were born and raised in the deep Jewish culture. Their language was Aramaic, the language of Jews and Judaism from uh, centuries before this. And of course, they were born and raised in Jerusalem or Galilee. And, and uh, you know, the picture of the, uh, that we have in the uh, Gospels would be of Palestinian Judaism. Uh, and then most of the Jews, however, the vast majority, were not born and raised in Jerusalem. <clears throat> they were born and raised in Rome or Ephesus or Corinth or Alexandria. Their language was not Aramaic. They did not speak the language of Palestinian Judaism. They spoke Greek. Uh, even though they shared the fundamental beliefs uh, and religious customs with with the Palestinian Jews through the presence of the synagogue all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> nevertheless, there were significant cultural differences uh, between them, and that, of course, brings cultural uh, uh, tensions, prejudices, whatever it might be. And we see some of those in the book of Acts. Just a couple of uh, passages. In chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, 
We're told that as the apostles began preaching, they preached in many different languages. And we are told in that section that there were people, Jews now, these are all Jews, in the uh, Jerusalem for the Pentecost, Festival of Pentecost. There were many Jews there, but they were speaking in <clears throat> many different languages because there were Jews from all over the world. So, so as the, uh, the church comes into being, is born in this context, they are born into already a culturally mixed uh, uh, congregation. And of course, the, the congregation of the Christian Jews in Jerusalem uh, shares this mixture of ethnic groups. Then, of course, in chapter 6, we are told that uh, tensions arose between the Hellenistic, or I think one translation calls them Grecian Jews, and the Hebraic Jews, or the Palestinian Jews, uh, over uh, discrimination, apparently, that was felt by some groups against other groups. And these groups, of course, uh, apparently were the various ethnic groups. Uh, nobody deliberately, uh, I don't think, tries to uh, create ethnic tensions in their congregations, at least not in Christian churches. And I don't think the early Jerusalem church was trying to do that. But the reality of the matter is in, in the book of Acts that cultural features, cultural dynamics play a very, very important role. Uh, and not just in the book of Acts, but in the writing of the rest of the New Testament. Uh, the Hellenistic uh, culture, uh, uh, not only of the Jews that are in the church, but also, of course, the Gentiles who are from Hellenism, and they're pure Hellenists, uh, is a very important part of the church. So we will track uh, some of these cultural tensions and changes and growths uh, as we go through. So those four things we have tracked uh, this evening from Acts 1 through 7. Just a few concluding words uh, to you uh, as, as we move on from uh, this lecture. Be ready tomorrow, or if you're looking at this <clears throat> video on Tuesday, then it's later on today. Uh, be ready to get on Zoom tomorrow uh, at 11 a.m. on Tuesday uh, that would be uh, March the 24th um, at 11 a.m. Uh, so if you haven't set up Zoom in your computer or your tablet or whatever, you need to do that. And uh, I have your email addresses. I sent out something earlier. So uh, I have your email addresses. I'll email you and give you a link to join the classroom at 11 a.m. So please be on time, uh, and uh, so do you have everything set for that? Because uh, those sessions are required. The school uh, expects that we will have face-to-face -face encounters, even though it's over uh, uh, the Internet. Uh, we will do that tomorrow. So be ready to get on Zoom tomorrow. Second of all, when we get together tomorrow at 11, bring your questions from the reading in Acts and from the video that you're looking at, and from the reading in the textbook, bring your questions. Be ready for uh, sharing your questions and hearing some of mine. I will expect that you have done all of this homework, you've listened to this video, you've read the textbook, you've thoroughly read and reread Acts 1 uh, through 7, and uh, be ready to come to discuss. And you will ask questions uh, if you have questions of this uh, this video lecture or whatever, we, we should have time for that. Uh, <clears throat> there will be no lecture tomorrow. It'll just be discussion. So be ready for that. Uh, that's your responsibility to make it a good for all of us uh, by doing that. Let me just point out that participation points, you know, we've had those in the semester so far. They will not just be based participation points from here on out will not be based solely on your contribution to the, the, to the discussion forum uh, that we have. Uh, it will mainly be based on your participation in the classes, the face-to-face -face classes, the Zoom sessions that we have every Tuesday and every Thursday. So, uh, <clears throat> so be, be aware that it's very important that you be with us on, on those times. Uh, 
I hope you have a good evening or a good morning. I look forward to seeing you again uh, very soon. Uh, and God bless you, and uh, good evening.